We live in a fast-paced and hectic world where it's easy to feel overwhelmed, stressed, and out of control. How do you manage all the competing pressures without losing sense of yourself? How do you stay focused enough to not only plot a path, but follow it? Welcome to Recovery Road, a show that offers inspiration, insight, and intelligence, as well as success stories from many walks of life that can show you how you can control your own destiny. Our knowledgeable and entertaining host and her guests give practical advice that you can use every day in the quest to master your life. Now, here's your host, Leah Mattinson. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. I'm host Leah Mattinson, and I want to first of all thank everyone for joining in with us wherever it is that you are sitting on this beautiful planet today. Uh, invite everyone to tune into the video version by coming to masteryourlife.ca. So if you're only listening to us on podcast, make sure you come over to the website so that you can watch my wonderful guest and I um, have this great discussion about self-sabotage. So uh, buckle yourselves in. I've got somebody from Canada coming on to actually talk about their life experience in self-sabotage and manipulation, which I think is at the forefront of a lot of people's mind, like, how did I get myself into this situation? So my guest today is uh, Jason Kristoff. And Jason, Jason is a self-sabotage expert who also runs an international self-sabotage coaching school. Jason discovered many years ago that manipulative psychology, behavior modification, brainwashing, mental conditioning, and mind control are continually weaponized against the public by media and government to make the public easier to control. So Joe Public, who are listening to this, tune in, tune in, tune in. <laughs> easier to control, govern, lie to. Do you feel like you've been lied to? Might want to stay for the whole episode. <laughs> Manipulate coerce and steal from. Jason's work is dedicated to exploring, discussing, exposing, and offering solutions to those modalities of covert public control. And you can contact Jason at his jason at freedomfromselfsabotage.com um, to directly inquire about his education programs and school, which teach positive forms of brainwashing so people can lead happier and more successful lives. Jason Christoph, welcome to the show today. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. I appreciate you having me on. We'll spread some knowledge today if we can. We absolutely will. So let's start out by just talking about how in the world did you get started on recognizing uh, the whole thing about self-sabotage, what was going on in your life and how long ago was that? Oh, I was a self-sabotage expert. And when that really means is I was in the business of destroying myself before I became a self-sabotage coach. So I graduated from McGill University in 1994, and I started my first uh, hard asset business about six months after that. And it was quite successful. It was a fitness club, and the market was really nice to me at the time. It became very successful. Financially, I was a young man at 24, and I had a lot of money at my disposal. And what I found out later, well, I didn't know at the time, but I found out later <laughs> that I had all these mind viruses implanted oh. in my psyche. How you doing? Everything okay? I'm good. Yeah. Sorry. We had okay. there. I'm back. Te technical difficulty. Technical so difficulty. I had all these mind viruses that I found out late. Well, I didn't know I had them. And obviously right. if I didn't know I had them, I didn't know where they came from, Right. but they were very self-abusive and they were lodged in a part of the brain that, you know, is put on cruise control most days. And I was acting out this self-abusive pattern over and over again with cocaine and steroids and alcohol and drugs and fast cars and, and staying up too late and not taking care of myself and bad food. And by the time I was 29 years old, I, I was actually paralyzed on one side of my body. I couldn't walk. And I phoned, I was on my deathbed because I just piled all that extra money into the self-abusive cycle. And the more money you put into that cycle, the more destruction you do to yourself. So I phoned the Czech Institute, which is a holistic healing institute in California, run by Paul Czech, the world's number one, one health guru. It's C-H-E-K. And they sent me one of their top practitioners who did what they always do. Come, coming in and seeing that yes, I'm sick and I'm, you know, I'm not going to live very long and I'm hurting myself. They don't deal with that. They deal with the psychological aspects to 
the current brainwashing and mind control that's running in your subconscious mind that's producing the behavior that's making you sick. So they really cured me really, really fast. And I was very excited to go to the Czech Institute myself and, you know, learn these skills. And then when I came back and started charging people a lot of, mo a lot of money to try and get them in shape, I found they were petrified. They were absolutely petrified to do what they said they wanted to do. They might say, I want to lose 30 pounds and they lose 10. And then you see this weird about face. Mm -hmm. They're nervous about going an extra pound toward that 30 pound goal. They're petrified of not fitting in with the herd petrified to give up their wine, petrified to give up their coffee and this massive scurrying event back to where they said they were miserable, where they said they were miserable. Mm -hmm. They somehow have been there so long. That's the only comfortable and familiar spot they know. So what I, I sort of went back to the check in student said, these people are terrified to be better, not only to lose weight, but to be healthier or wealthier, better relationships, quit their addictions. So what's going on with the majority of folks here? And they said, well, they're just, they're just like you. They have this repetitive content running on the cruise control part of their mind. And they think if they become better than the average, that the herd will attack them. So the only option is to brainwash them and go directly at the cruise control part of the brain called the subconscious. And I said, well, okay, that would have been great to know a little earlier in the game, but okay. So I went, went back and I started using mind control and brainwashing and behavior modification techniques on my clients. And it's the only thing that has ever worked to help them uh, propel themselves into a better future. And then they didn't need me because I hacked the cruise control part of the brain. I didn't need to meet with them. They didn't need to keep investing with me. They would go to the fridge and eat healthy food all the time. I basically had mind controlled them uh, using the same mind control techniques that were used on me, but in a negative way, but there's only one set. I mean, that's one of the big secrets. There's only one set of mind control tactics. You can, hack someone in a negative way, or you can hack them in a positive way. There's no, there's not two different uh, ways to do this. And what I did is I hacked them in positive ways and they would foam. Yeah, I lost the 30 pounds. I lost the extra five. <laughs> I haven't drank wine in a year. And I'm like, great, good. What are you doing? Well, I don't know. I just, after that time, we had that little session and you, you did that weird thing to my brain. I've been on cruise. And I'm like, great, perfect. So that's how I became a self-sabotage coach. And although I don't, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching for my students in my school, uh, inside the school, I do teach health professionals, including many medical doctors, chiropractors, and I teach them how to work with their clients so they stop hurting themselves. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how I came across. It's, it's a very rewarding system because you actually uh, get paid well, and you also see your clients succeed. So it's an even trade, which is what I want spiritually. Right, right. Uh, so you went from this own personal story. I, I hear so many people are struggling with addictions around cocaine. That's a mind blower for me. And it's just like, like, how do you people afford it? It's like, oh, yeah, because you've got lots of money. So question about that time or me, and maybe even now is why do you think it is that when people have a ton of resources, that they do not actually channel the resources into things that are uh, good, like humanitarian or well, philanthropic or whatever. Yeah, well, we'll go down the rabbit hole just one step <laughs> because Perfect. that sort of programming to destroy yeah. oneself is purposely riddled through the media mm -hmm. so that you do do it on a low budget scale with the wine and the coffee and the junk food and the takeout food on a Friday night that you categorize as a treat or a reward. It's not fit for a maggot to consume. And so it's just the extension of the same program. Most people today, you might say, yeah, there are some people that have a large monetary budget that are addicted to cocaine, but 80% of the population is either obese or overweight. 
So what we're seeing there is a general self-abuse trend. Mm -hmm. And that self-abuse trend is purposely manufactured in a way where 85% of all mind control is repetition based. Mm -hmm. And the reason repetition hacks our behavior outside our conscious awareness is we have this very loving part of the brain called the subconscious and it loves repetitive content because that repetitive content reflects this protection mechanism that no one really knows they have. So this protection mechanism is to look for the repetitive content and to know that the repetitive content will reflect what the majority or bigger herd is doing, thinking, or saying. And this invisible protection mechanism is designed to find the majority content, knowing that it's safer in the bigger herd and that if the bigger herd accepts you, you're probably going to be safer and more secure. And then that repetitive content becomes a script. Mm -hmm. and, it, and then that script, whether you know it or not, or like it or not, becomes your behavior. And this happens outside your conscious awareness. Now, I'll give you an example of this. Mm -hmm. In the year 2001, there was a movie called Gone in 60 Seconds. Mm -hmm. And it was with Angelina Jolie and Nicolas Cage. And it was very repetitive about car theft. Nicolas Cage was a retired car thief, one of the best. And Nicolas Cage's brother, I think it was in San Francisco. And his brother got in trouble with the local thug. And the local thug said to Nicolas Cage, I'm going to wipe the, the, the debt of your brother clean if you steal 100 cars from me in one night. Right. And so that's the premise of the movie. And this part of the brain is also proven. It's called the subconscious mind pathway or the subconscious. It's proven not to know the difference between real time and imagined thought and screen time. So the people who rule us know this. And what this means is when you're sitting in the cinema watching Gone in 60 Seconds, there's a group of people that know uh, stuff that you don't know. You don't know how this part of the brain works, but they know that your brain is processing the images on the screen like you're actually in a car theft tribe. The repetitive content is very repetitive and it's car theft based. And this invisible protection mechanism says, hey, you're in a car theft tribe because I'm getting all this downloaded repetitive content indicating we are. So for us to bond here with this tribe, we're going to flash the gang colors of car theft. Now, when that movie was released in Burnaby, BC, Canada, car theft went up 70% in the first four days. Woo. The co cops started phoning around and seeing other car theft jumps around cities and started putting it together that was, you know, it was directly related to this movie rolling out. And this is what the people who rule us know. They have a phrase, what's on the screen at in the morning will be on the street at night. Yes. And when you talk about cocaine, you're talking people that's watched Scarface. They watch Reservoir Dogs. They They've watched Cheech and Chong. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what movie you go to because not only will this part of the brain fixate on like it can do particulars like car theft. That's very particular, but it can also do patterns. It can do patterns like this is a self-abusive tribe. And if you're in a self-abusive tribe to gain hierarchy, safety, and security, you know, because it's always trying this Safety mechanism is always trying to make you act like the majority. Yeah. And it uses that sort of tabulation process of seeing what the majority is doing. And it's always trying to make you fit in. And today's biggest theme is you got to have a poison. What's your poison? Even at a bar, when you see someone walk up in a movie, what's your poison? Right? Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you can't fit in unless you show up an absolute mess. Mm -hmm. And this part of the brain is obsessed with you fitting in. And oddly enough, this brain, one of its functions, it has no ability to judge long-term consequences of the script it's forcing you to act out because it's safety guy. It's the safety function. And if you sort of had this thinking ability where you judge long-term consequences, you would know the cocaine will get you nowhere.
He'll know the car theft will get you nowhere. The wine every night will get you nowhere. The coffee in the morning actually will get you absolutely nowhere because it's a, it's a toxin. It's a psychoactive substance. It comes from a class of poisons called alkaloid poisons, and it destroys your body and your mental health. If you ever wanted to find out about how dangerous coffee is, you can read the book Caffeine Blues by Stephen Chernisky. You'll see how dangerous that is. So it doesn't judge long-term consequences. And the biggest theme, which is, let's take another step down the rabbit hole. Purposely, the biggest theme that is purposely riddled through all media, all TV, all movies, all print media, all radio, that's why they have songwriters and no one's allowed to write their own songs anymore. Right. Is they want you drowning in a couple different themes, self-abusive with poisons and hedonism. Uh, grown men acting like children is another one that's very popular in their hacking of this uh, subconscious mind pathway that lives off repetitive content, single women. Um, there's many themes that they want and they don't really care what movie you go to. They will give you the fake freedoms. You go to the Cineplex, you got eight choices. You got uh, Chris Tucker, Chris Rock, Morgan Freeman, Brad Pitt, yeah. George Clooney, whatever you want to see. They're like, yeah, take your pick. Why? Why? Well, because they put the same themes through every movie. So they don't care because they know this subconscious mind pathway, which downloads repetitive content in an attempt to make you safer and bond with the bigger herd, will look more to the background images and overall themes than the central field of view, which is the actor. So I've, I, I analyze movies and TV shows all the time and pause them to show the background information that the conscious mind is missing, the subconscious is picking up, and those images are purposely riddled through your media to hack your behavior outside your conscious awareness. How does that sound? It's, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm, it's so outrageous because I, I guess like I, I got diagnosed 14 years ago with a neurological disease. So I decided to not watch a lot of TV that everyone else was watching actually longer ago than that. Like when Survivor first came out, uh, people phone me and go, Hey, are you watching Survivor? I'm like, no, I don't need to watch something that's teaching me to outwit, outlast and outplay. I, like, what is that? What, what is that? Well, why would I want to know that? And it doesn't make me feel good. So no. Uh, and Disney is another one that I go, the repetitive themes of Disney shows, like I'm a grandmother and what is, the, what is this thing where it's all this or fantasy that that this fantasy that life is a fantasy that you don't actually have to show up and do any work that, you know, things are just going to be handed to you. Like that's sort of predominant theme. And then we have a lot of people who don't want to do any work and you see that they just kind of go, well, isn't that just going to show up for me? Isn't somebody just going to provide that for me? <laughs> so, but it, but it's uh, when you say that to people, well, even at the beginning of the shenaniganifest in 2020 and the news anchors were going on, mixing cocktails in the morning on the bro breakfast shows in the mornings. I'm like, what are these people doing <laughs> to cocktails? Well, he, here's <laughs> another piece of the puzzle, right? Because the, this greatest love story ever told about the subconscious always trying to protect you. Let me, ex let me expand on that too. Yes. I will tell you exactly why they were getting paid to mix drinks on the show. There's a secondary part of the brain that also loves you that works in tandem with the part of the brain I've already described. So the mm. part of the brain that goes along to get, you know, go along to get along, people please, reflexively obedient to the majority. Mm -hmm. That's the part of the brain I have already described. Right. You do not want, yeah, that's the subconscious. You don't want that part of the brain sort of, in the uh, protector position too often because it will take a need to authority. It's non-thinking, it's compliant. And compliance is the different, it's a completely opposite to rational and logical thought. The best love story ever told, there's a tandem, there's a partner to this part of the brain. 
It's the opposite. It's called the conscious mind. Mm -hmm. It uses the eyes and it uses the thinking part of the brain, which is called the prefrontal cortex. Now your natural design is to have the conscious thinking eyesight defense mechanism as the primary defense mechanism. So picture two defense mechanisms, the conscious, which is maybe five feet in front of the subconscious and the subconscious will only get involved, only get involved when the conscious mind, this thinking part of the brain fails its duty. Ah. And then the subconscious literally in a, in a loving exchange says, Hey, conscious mind, you don't look so good. I'm analyzing your thought patterns. You're failing your charge. You're not probably going to do so good at defending us. Could you maybe go hit the shower? I'm going to step into the defensive position. Use my defense mechanism, which is compliance. Wow. Alcohol <laughs> changes brain function so detrimentally that the, the whole defensive complex takes the conscious mind and sends it to the shower instantly when you're drinking or instantly when you see alcohol. You don't even have to drink it. Showing the alcohol, pouring even a fake drink initiates that you, because again, this That's part of the brain doesn't know the difference between real life screen time and imagined thought. So you're imagining the drink and no, it literally thinks you're drinking, which means your ability to use your brain is going to go into the failure zone. And when your brain can't think properly, you're open to attack. And, the, and so basically that conscious mind is fired mm -hmm. from its bouncer position in defense of you and said, lovingly, go take a shower, come back when you're ready to do your job again. This is why they want everybody drinking mm -hmm. and caffeine has been proven the most effective agent to get the conscious mind out of the bouncer position and move the obedient part of the brain into the defensive position. And if you're in the ruling position, like if you're the king with the crown, you're wearing the purple robe, you're ruling, you want the conscious mind in the shower and you want the obedient sort of people pleaser, you want it at the, at the starting line. You want it in the defense position because that means the population, if you can put them where their reflexively obedient compliant part of the mind is in charge of the behavior, you can have complete way with them without physical force. Yeah. Crazy, hey? But crazy when you say it fast, but it's so apparent by the way that people behave. It, does uh, decaffeinated coffee work the same as caffeinated coffee? Is it the same as seeing the alcohol, drinking the alcohol? Absolutely. And the that's same. why in a lot of shows, and I'm Canadian, mm -hmm. like Canada AM with Seamus O'Regan. I know he's retired now, but I went to school with Seamus. Mm -hmm. And when you'll see a lot of new shows and the anchors will have these empty, they are empty, this coffee mug, mm -hmm. because the coffee mug invokes the same response as actually drinking coffee. And if you look into like the CIA textbook for the best psychoactive substances, psychoactive just means it affects brain function. The most efficient psychoactive substance that removes the conscious defense mechanism and puts this childlike <laughs> compliant part to the finish to the starting line is caffeine and things like LSD and also things like marijuana and alcohol. Right. So th this is what the average person doesn't know. If they're having a hard time, wealth wise, health wise, weight wise, cellular wise, relationship wise. It's because this part of the brain is being purposely hacked by negative content in the media. And even the word media comes from an ancient country, thousands of years old called, um, it is actually, that's the name of the country. Sorry. Media. The, it's called media. It's where, where Iran is today and Azerbaijan is today. And this repetitive based hacking to yeah. dominate someone's behavior was sold to kings and queens of the Mediterranean 
out of out of this uh, country called media, and the name of the people that sold this technology were called the Medes. And even though we didn't have TV or movie screens, they would use the town square and they would set up the content and the words they would use to be repetitive in the way that you would hack someone through the movie and the TV screen today. So this is very ancient technology. And this is how sort of humans have been, been getting farmed like cattle for many, many generations. And right now it appears that we're getting looked at uh, as uh, beef cattle where before we were looked at as uh, milking cattle. And I think that has a lot of people very nervous. Mm -hmm. And, and so, yeah, without dipping too far down that rabbit hole also, people who are nervous understand what's going on in the secondary script. And for more information, they can come to your school to have private con consultations or conversations about that stuff that's not going to get us booted off of any airwaves. <laughs> so, no, def yeah. def so, definitely not. You, you won't get booted off the airwaves right. by just sort of generalizing that yeah. the subconscious mind pathway is easy to hack. It is easy to hack. And with this repetition, also, I can see um, on Facebook and in groups now more so than ever, because as you're scrolling through, through the feeds, um, it's like every second thing is about drinking coffee. And everyone does this pressure to each other, too. It's like um, influencers are drinking coffee there um, or it's five o'clock, it's wine time or any occasion as a time to have a cup of coffee or they can't get out of bed without their coffee or they're, you know, they can't go to bed without their glass of wine. So they can't get up, they can't go to sleep without some sort of a stimulant. And that is like prevalent throughout every um, group that I know. And that's a predominant conversation about what are you drinking? What kind of coffee are you drinking? What, you know, if you look at the budget that people spend on their coffee, it's just mind blowing. You go, how do you even afford that? And they go, they look at you like you've got a forked tongue, but uh, it, it is these little things that kind of intervene on our, on our health and well being uh, that are the slippery slope. So what are kind of the repetitive things that we see now in that are things that are tripping people up uh, more than ever? Is there two or three? Are there any like big culprits? The most repetitive content in all Hollywood film mm -hmm. is the coffee symbology. So it would be a coffee cup, a coffee mug. Um, it would be a coffee machine or a coffee shop, like a coffee machine on the back counter. And for, you know, for the reasons why they want you to just like Nicholas, you know, just like the people stealing the cars in gone in 60 seconds, people are going to go out and repetitively act out the content of their movies and they can watch any movie, the average length of time before a coffee cup, coffee mug, coffee shop, or coffee machine shows up on the back counters about 12 minutes. You can pick any modern show, try not to pick the space ones, but even in space, they're probably drinking some coffee, but just try to pick, go, go to Netflix tonight. If you want, I, I don't suggest it, but if you want to right. test it, um, go and, and look up and just really focus because you can get into trance really easy staring at a screen. Like all hypnotic trances are based on what's called fixing the gaze. This is why the old hypnotists used to use the watch back and forth. Look at the watch. You're getting very sleepy. Anytime you focus the gaze of the eyesight, uh, the compliant part of the brain goes on because the, the eyesight's not supposed to focus on a single point or a single, a very small point of attention because it puts you in danger. So this, you know, this is good. This happens automatically within 20 seconds of anybody watching the screen, their subconscious mind pathway is activated. That's the compliant part. But so if you could just keep yourself lucid, keep yourself aware, keep your conscious mind on when you're watching the show, you're definitely going to be able to pick up the coffee mug, coffee shop, coffee pot, whatever's on the back, uh, on the back counter or being held by the actor. Wow. And so does tea also count for that? Ab absolutely. Caffeine, again, is their, their most effective uh, weapon 
to bring the subconscious, this compliant part to the forefront and have it dominate our behavior. So chocolate, diet pop, regular pop. That's why they have the Halloween for the kids. Chocolate is the gateway drug to coffee. And they want the kids as well, chocolified. And in, if people want to see how much caffeine affects brain function, they can go to the YouTube video uh, and they can just put in ABC, which is the American news Ag uh, station, ABC MRI, the scanning equipment at a hospital, ABC MRI and put coffee, where an ABC reporter goes into an MRI without drinking coffee has a normal brain scan and then drinks only one eight ounce cup of coffee, which is very small, lies back down, gets sucked back into the MRI. And the doctor eyeballing the MRI shocked and said, that's a little odd. Your brain flow and your oxygen flow to your brain is down 40%. 40% on an eyeballing. And in Stephen Chernisky's book, somewhere in there, he goes into the non-eyeballing research and one cup of coffee shuts your blood flow to your brain down by 52%. So the, the primary defense mechanism, which is your brain uh, is, is down. It's down and, and this really activates the subconscious compliant, reflexively obedient part of the brain. So there's this intoxication effect that the average person doesn't understand. And even though if they just want to focus on the fact that they are losing half the blood flow to their brain, half the oxygen to their brain by drinking coffee, maybe that could jar them a little bit to potentially read Stephen Chernisky's book, Caffeine Blues, to see how just how dangerous and toxic and poisonous this substance is. So what is the effect when the brain doesn't have oxygen or flow? Well, basically on, a, on the level of the switcheroo, the only, def like if your thinking part of the brain isn't active, the uh, head defense, the head bouncer gets hauled off and sent in the shower. It, you, you're not going to be able to think straight. And because caffeine is a poison, it sort of retracts the nerves that feel the, the world. You're not going to feel the world. You're going to be numb. You're going to be tranquilized. Caffeine has been known in many circles to make the slavery feel groovy. And it's also known to make people similar to Adderall, make people do boring tasks longer. And so when you're in the business of sort of farming human cattle, it's optimal that they don't feel the sting of their or their mundane lives mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if they could feel they're stepping on a nail i mean when you feel a nail go in your foot or through your shoe you certainly step off very quickly caffeine alcohol sugar junk food thc tylenol motrin these all dull the nervous system so you don't really know if your spouse loves you or is mad at you because you can't feel it you don't know if you like or hate your job because you can't feel it. You can't, you know, you don't know if you spent too much or you're being too frugal because you can't feel it. So you lose your ability. Your tacit perception of life is decreased immensely. And you don't know where you're, when you're in trouble. You don't know when you're safe. You don't know when you're in trouble. And if we could sum up something today, many people don't know how much danger they're in currently. And because potentially their nervous system is offline through their toxic ingestion mm -hmm. and that toxic ingestion is riddled throughout their media and they will copy that, that repetitive concept, uh, co uh, content outside their conscious awareness. Yeah, so monkey see, monkey do, uh, the, the, uh, or cows, cattle see, cattle do. I'm really struck, uh, Jason, because the, uh, the, the number of people that follow the podcast have serious neurological disorders, and they would say that they're in generally pretty good health. A lot of them, a lot of people think they're in pretty, my thinking's pretty good. My thinking's pretty clear, but if you're 50% diminished in your ability to make a decision right after 7am, what, what's the rest of your day looking like? And proceeding to do, and we're responsible not only for ourselves, but again, I mentioned I'm a grandmother 
I'm responsible for these little ones. And that if my, in, uh, if I'm unable to protect them, then because my poor decision-making, then also when I have moments of we'll call sanity or sobriety, when you're not on caffeine or you're not drinking or you're not taking whatever the drugs are, then you feel really bad about the stuff that you've done, which also traps you into, I got to run back. So that very first opener where you said people are horrified or terrified, they're terrified of actually changing. Do you think that that's part of that feeling terrified really is the feeling regret about what they've created? And so they don't want to face the, what if I really turn this around or change this around? That's a big problem on its own because the illusion can feel so comfortable Mm-hmm. That reality is not want, you just don't want to interface with it whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So people are so used to numbing themselves with these substances that are actually just poisons. And the reason they feel numb is because the body is so hating of the poisons that it's, it doesn't even want to leave its nerve tentacles hanging out in the bloodstream. So it retracts them because the poison will kill the nerves. So it actually just retracts the nerves and people can feel so comfortable in this numb down state. And then of course, when you don't feel your way through life, like I said, mm-hmm. you don't know if you're poor or you're rich. You don't know if your kids are bad or good. You don't know if your wife or husband loves you or not. So things get messy and messy people who love the illusion. They're also proven never to do what psychologists called individuate, which means mature from child to adult. Mm -hmm. People who are having passionate love affairs with these painkillers are also known to reflect this forever child psychological position where they can't run their own lives Mm -hmm. because they're not really willing to be an adult and face any pain. For you to mature, it's been proven in psychology, for you to mature as a child, from a child to an adult, you need pain Mm -hmm. and you need failure. And the people who are ruling us riddle us and, you know, riddle our environment with painkillers, frame pain as a goblin when really it's a guardian. And they're also trying to bubble wrap the society so that no one fails. Like you can't, no one everybody passes in school now that's funny so or everybody gets a participation ribbon even the guy who plays sixth or last in a six-man race at a sports event at the school you just robbed that kid robbed him of the pain he needs to become a better runner and so this this constant framing of safe spaces and there's no more thumbs down on YouTube because it might offend someone in California. Now they don't even make people write the SATs because someone might fail and have some pain and they pass everybody. So this is all what, what's called Tavistock social engineering based on the weaponization of, of foundational psychology that humans need pain and failure to become adults. Yeah. Talk about Tavistock because a lot of people aren't familiar with that. We've talked about it on the podcast before, um, but haven't mentioned it for probably the last couple of years. Uh, But for those who are unfamiliar with that glorious institution. (laughs) It's it's just a place where they would document uh, all the psychological experiments and basically how to weaponize them, not to the advantage of the human race, but weaponize them against the human race. So this is one example is that the base foundational psychology is you need pain and failure Mm -hmm. to produce a group of adults. And if humans are robbed of the pain and failure by painkillers and everything's got to be a safe space, you actually produce adults that act, talk, and think like children. And they're called the paraternist in French, or they're called the forever child Mm -hmm. in English. And these are the most dangerous uh, citizens. They will destroy the society from the inside out because they lack leadership. They act, talk, and think like children in adult leadership roles. And they will basically incinerate the society from the inside. So much so that in Sparta, there was a rite of passage for, for men to make them men. And they would lock them outside the city for seven days in a row. They weren't allowed to come back. And that was all about 
uh, breaking the bond with the mother and teaching the child to think on their own. Yeah. And then it, it, there was gray wolves outside the walls and some children were eaten and didn't come back. And if a child had an easy time of it, like if the gray wolves weren't really uh, ferocious and the child came back and had an easy time of the rite of passage, and if that child didn't mature, they knew it was so dangerous for an adult to be of adult age. And if they did talk, think, and act like a child, they would actually murder that citizen. There would be a, a collusion, a conspiracy that they would actually have a vote and say, you know, Jim has to die tonight. He's too dangerous to live. He'll destroy the tribe eventually. Yeah. And we have so many actors and actresses like this in our society today that are going along to get along. They're being compliant they're forging a societal fabric that will end in misery for the overall collective for generations to come. And it's because they've never, the, the, the way our social system works, they never had the pain and experience to become a moral ethical adult. Yeah, this is a really important point uh, because criminality was almost nothing. Psychopathology was almost nothing in Sparta because they actually did that um, well, right culling, culling, culling of the people who were psychopaths, who didn't actually, who were criminals and who couldn't uh, or would put the whole tribe at risk. And so uh, there's other cultures who have done that. It's, and it's been completely um, either whitewashed or hidden, you know, so the criminality that we've got going on now is just unreal. And it's at multiple generations, too. So uh, we, we've all kind of got to look at ourselves first and go, what is the thing that I'm doing that is maybe making me be part of this uh, delusion or group illusion? How would, how would you characterize it? Like a, a group mind? <laughs> it, it would just be basically, I'll be honest with you, the use of the repetitive content in the movies and the TV shows have been organized by people that aren't really good people. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, being that they're not good people, one of their goals is they have no intention to change their, their evil no. ways. No. So they have used the repetitive content throughout their movies or TV shows to make a lot of people just as evil as they are, which is their goal because they want to walk out in the light. Mm -hmm. right? They're vampires. <laughs> they want to walk out among us without being told, hey, you're a bad person. So their goal was to make everybody just as dark, evil, and hedonistic as they were through this general decay, the slow drip decay. It's called Fabianism. That was from Emperor Fabius. He would destroy his enemies an inch at a time, death by a thousand cuts. So we're under that sort of psychological operation right now, death by a thousand cuts. Everything is... A, like you watch Netflix, it's about serial killers, death and darkness and mayhem and murder, hedonism, single moms, single disempowered males. Yeah, eating e children, eating e children. Eating. What, what about just, you know, Thanos uh, in the movie Avengers Affinity Wars? He throws his own daughter off the cliff and kills his own daughter. If people right. knew the psychological impact mm -hmm. of seeing a dad kill his own daughter... Yeah. Okay. I sat in the theater at that movie and I said, that can't, out loud, that can't be how this goes. What? Yeah, so well, I was lucky I didn't get kicked out because I, I kept going, that can't be right. Come on. What's the matter with you? That's why all the writers are the same for the movies and all the writers are the same for the shows because the people ruling us just lean in with one call and say, these are the images I need you to riddle in there. Anything in between, you can write what you want, but make sure this theme is consistent throughout the movie, death and mayhem. And so we, so the reason people are, you know, the reason we're going in this negative direction is that what hangs on your wall is the old town square in media. Mm -hmm. Like that is a town square. It's not a TV. It's there to, give you repetitive content that your subconscious will follow outside your conscious awareness. And it's there to slow drip you your worst life. And you're going to act it out if you don't know how to, what these things are, who these people are, what their intentions are. You're going to be in real trouble. And, you know, when I say you're going to be, I should say you're in trouble. 
So uh, as a non-TV watcher, I just want to ask this because it, it's, uh, it, it's like, should you watch TV to be able to defend yourself against this? Because, or not, like people would say, have you watched Game of Thrones? And I'm like, uh, no, not even one episode. <laughs> but then I go, why are people so evil? Like, what the heck? Are, why are people thinking this way? I feel like I can't even, I don't, it's like, can I defend myself? Can a person defend themselves? Like, because this is part of also the being outside of the um, collective, so to speak, is the people who are trying to not be part of the cattle herd, that there is like, how do you defend yourself? You can't because there was, there's three, three examples where uh, Bill Gates did not let his kids play with the computers. Steve mm -hmm. Jobs did not let his kids play with iPads. Just recently, Noah Harari of the World Economic Forum says he does not look at his phone because he doesn't have the capability to override the algorithms in his own brain. So this is how powerful these images are. They've been honed over thousands of years. The average person doesn't know they have a subconscious mind, so obviously they don't know how it works. And if you wanted to just potentially experiment and look for the coffee, and as soon as you see the coffee, shut the movie off, start another movie. And then as soon as you see the coffee mug, coffee shop, coffee machine on the back counter, or the coffee cup, shut that movie off, go to another one. Let me know how it turns out, because I already know how it turns out. Yeah, you with a sore wrist from turning shut stuff off. <laughs> yeah, you'll only watch uh, three to 15 minutes of every show, I guarantee it. And so is there a difference between hearing things like as in a podcast versus watching it on uh, YouTube or watching it on another platform? I can tell you that the auditory uh, download of repetitive content is not only ferocious, but completely bizarre. And I'll give you a, an example. If you want to see a great hacking of this part of the brain, go to YouTube, put in Max Major, who's the mentalist, put in AGT, which stands for America's Got Talent and put semifinal. Max Major hacks Howie Mandel in three minutes, makes him draw something that Max wants him to draw, mm -hmm. makes him pick a time on Max's watch, uh, which Max set himself and Howie picked the same time, which was on Max's watch. And how we did that was uh, through repetitive content placing, mm -hmm. not only with images. So basically he made Howie Mandel draw a sun, by riddling six sun symbols throughout his presentation. And then when Howie drew the sun and Max Major said, Howie, put your drawing down. Now I'm going to go get mine. And he turned, Max Major turned his drawing around and said, Howie, does yours drawing happen to look like this? And Howie's like, you got to be kidding me. That's exactly what I drew. Because the subconscious mind pathway looked for the rep repetitive sun symbols throughout Max Major's uh, talk. And then just flash the gang signs to blend in with that herd. But the four o'clock was even more bizarre because it was auditory. As Max Major was speaking to Howie Mandel just up before he did the hack, and the time that Howie Mandel picked on Max Major's watch was four o'clock. It's because Max Major used the word perform performance before comf comfortable, which there's a four in there, and also the word four. Those are five phonetic fours. Some of those phonetic fours are intertwined in other words that don't even sound like four. And so Max Major says, Howie, I'm going to set a time on my watch. I have it facing to me. I'm going to go hang it on this hook I, so I cannot put my hands on it. Howie, I want you to close your eyes. Think of a watch. Think of the, the hands of the watch spinning round and round. It stops at a time. Howie, open your eyes. What time do you see? It says four o'clock. And so he goes and gets his watch hanging on the, on the hook, turns it around. He says, there it is, Howie, four o'clock. Howie's like, unbelievable. How did you do that? So what I'm trying to say is the auditory cues in your songs, the words they use, hide other words that, that impact your behavior. If you want to see how weird this can be, go watch that video, Max Major, AGT, semifinal. That was wild. 
it's wild. Wild. And, wild. and you, again, it's coming back to that, how to like protecting yourself and moving away from that. Uh, so I just, we're out of time for this episode. So when we've barely touched on like Jason's actual work, so I would just want his, the, the other work part. So Jason, I'd love to invite you back for another session. If you're willing to do a part two. Yeah. If you, if, I mean, if, if everything goes good with the part one and people like it, sure. Absolutely. Okay. And how can people find you? Like, how can people work with you? Cause we didn't get into how to actually get out of this trouble because that's actually what people want that are listening to this podcast is, okay, I've been involved in this uh, for a number of years and I don't want my children to be subjected to this. How do I get some coaching and guidance around that? Well, I, you know, I have a website, jchristoff.com, uh, Christoph, just the initial J, uh, uh, Christoph is Christ with an OFF on the end. But you could just email me personally at jason at freedomfromselfsabotage.com. I send out a daily report of basically things that you should be seeing. And some of them are positive. Some of them are neutral. Uh, some of them highlight things that a lot of people don't want to see. But it's important you understand what's, you know, what's being hidden from you. So that if you email me personally... I can get you on what's called the Kristoff report and you can get slow drip this very interesting information for free, free of charge, just a little bit over time. It's like a long, the Fabianistic approach. I'm going to inch by <laughs> inch. I'll, I'll make sure you're awake at the end of uh, maybe a couple of weeks. Right. Fabianistic, maybe by hugging instead of by cutting. That <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm going <laughs> to enlightenment by a thousand hugs. There you go. See, that's more my speed. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for being such a wonderful guest and bringing uh, wonderful tools and insight uh, to the audience. I know I have got a ton of takeaways for myself and to bring into my family, and that's the most valuable tool. So uh, much great, great appreciation for the work that you're doing. And uh, yeah, just so much to unpack. So thanks again, everybody. Love yourselves. Love each other. Mind your minds. That's all for us. Bye for now. Thank you for being a part of our program today. Master Your Life is a presentation of Leah Mattinson Enterprises, Inc. Join us next time on Master Your Life, helping you to discover the very best of you.